Hello everyone and welcome to the video lecture series on the on intro to algebra. My name is Professor Hunter and today we are going to be starting off with a little bit of an introduction into some basic algebraic concepts, some basic algebra terms, and some basics on different kinds of numbers. So starting off with base, some basic algebra vocabulary that we are going to be using throughout the rest of the course. So a variable is any letter that is used to represent an unknown number. We generally avoid using the letters E, I, and O as variables. The reasons why lowercase e and lowercase i are avoided you will see in future courses. The reason that O is avoided is, you know, it looks like a zero, so that's why. But any, really, any letter can be used to represent any unknown number. You're used to variables like x or y, but really anything can be used to represent an unknown number. Now, an expression that contains one or more variables is called a variable expression. Variables or expressions are also known as algebraic expressions. So an algebraic expression is any expression that contains variables, numbers, and arithmetic operations such as multiplication and addition and subtraction. So each of these are examples of variable expressions. We have the expression 3x. It combines the number 3, the variable x, and the hidden multiplication between the two. Variable expressions come in all different shapes and sizes. So this next one, this negative 2y squared minus 6y plus 4 is also a variable expression. And you can have variable expressions with more than one variable. So the variables a and b are both used in this last example, 3ab minus b squared minus 1.5. That last example is what is called a multivariable expression. Now, a constant is another name for a known number. So for example, this 4 that is on the end of this expression, this is also called a constant. It is another name for a known number. A coefficient is a number that appears next to a variable and is attached to that variable with usually hidden multiplication. So that first example, 3x, 3 is what is called the coefficient because it is a number that is attached to a variable with hidden multiplication. If you don't see any operations between a number and a variable, you can always assume that there is multiplication there. So 3 is called a coefficient. Now an algebraic expression is an expression that combines variables, constants, and arithmetic operations. Now algebraic expressions can have more one or more what are called terms. Terms in an algebraic expression are variables and or constants that are either a se separated by a plus sign or a minus sign. And there are two different types of terms. An algebraic term is a term that contains a variable. A constant term does not contain a variable. Now, remember, any time that you have a number that is attached to a variable with multiplication, it is technically considered a single term. So 3x here, because the 3 and the x are attached with hidden multiplication, it is considered one single term. Terms are only separated by plus signs or minus signs. So anything linked with multiplication or division is considered a single term, and terms are only separated by plus signs and minus signs. Now for each of these, we are going to state the number of terms in the expression and we are going to identify the variable terms and the constant terms. Now one thing I will say, because we are going to be dealing with signed numbers in this, uh, in this lecture, is that any number always takes the sign to its immediate left. So if there is a plus sign or nothing to its immediate left, the number is positive. If there is a minus sign to its immediate left, the number is negative. So we have this first expression, 2a squared minus 5a plus 7. So let's first count up the number of terms. So 2a squared here, because the 2 and the a squared are both attached with multiplication, that is considered one single term. The minus sign separates it into another term. So this minus 5a is another term. And because the 5 and the a are linked with multiplication, they are considered all one term.
Then this plus sign separates it into a third term. Seven, just by itself, is considered a term because it was separated by that plus sign. So there are three terms in this expression. So the algebraic terms are the terms that contain variables. So the algebraic terms here, 2a squared contains a variable, so 2a squared is one of your algebraic terms. And this minus 5a is also another algebraic term. A number always takes the sign to its left. So since to the left of 5 there was a minus sign, that 5 is technically a negative 5. So negative 5a is a algebraic term. Now constant terms, are terms that do not contain variables. So the constant term here is this 7. 7 just by itself because it didn't have any variables attached to it is considered a constant term and because it was separated by that plus sign it is considered its own term. Now what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to try the next one. I want you guys to determine the number of terms in this expression, identify the variable terms, and identify any constant terms. Remember that a number always takes the sign to its left. So go ahead and pause the video and resume when you want to check your answer. All right, so if we count up the number of terms, remember terms are only separated by a plus sign or a minus sign. So 6n squared here, because that is attached with multiplication, that is all considered one term. This plus sign separates this into another term. So 3 and n are attached with multiplication. So that is all considered one term. So that's term number two. And then the minus sign makes this last number, this negative 4, its own term. And that gives us three terms in this expression. So the algebraic terms are the terms that contain variables. In this case, your variable is n. So your algebraic terms are going to be 6n squared and this positive 3n. The constant terms are the terms that do not contain a variable. So this minus 4 that is on the end here does not have a variable attached to it, so minus 4 is considered a constant term. And yes, this 4 is negative because that 4 takes the sign to its immediate left, so it is a negative 4. Now, what we can do with algebraic expressions is remember that these variables represent unknown numbers. There are going to be times, especially in formulas, when you are asked to evaluate an algebraic expression at a given value of a variable. So you will be told, evaluate this algebraic expression when this variable equals this specific known number. So to evaluate an algebraic expression, what you're going to do is you're going to plug that number into every single place you see that variable occur. And if the variable occurs more than once, you do need to plug it into every single place the variable occurs. Now, I will emphasize that you do need to use parentheses whenever you are plugging in a variable into, you know, a number in for a variable. The reason is because there are a lot of terms that contain, like 3x here, that contain hidden multiplication. You don't want to go plugging in a number for a variable and forget that there's multiplication there. Like if you're plugging in 2 for your x, you don't want to accidentally think this is 32 instead of 3 times 2. So just please use parentheses when you are plugging a number in for a variable. And we're going to get more into order of operations a little bit later, but just as, you know, when we do learn order of operations, that is always going to apply. We're not going to be seeing that much of it here. We're going to be focusing on algebraic expressions that have just one operation. But do keep in mind that when we do start to see algebraic expressions with more than one operation, there is a specific order that you must do those operations. So you do have to keep that in mind when you're evaluating more complicated variable expressions. And we're going to be doing those a little bit more later in the chapter. So this process for plugging a number in for a variable is also called substitution. So the process of plugging the number 2 in for the variable x is called substituting 2 in for the variable x. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these expressions and we are going to evaluate them at the given value of the variable. So we have the algebraic expression n plus 8 and we're told to evaluate it when the variable n is equal to 15. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 15 with parentheses around it and I am going to plug it into this expression into the spot that I see an n. Anything that is not an n needs to be left alone and left exactly where it is. So I'm going to plug 15 in for n and then because this plus 8 did not involve an n I'm going to just leave it alone and leave it exactly where it is. Then I'm going to just do the operation that I see here. 15 plus 8 gives us 23. So then we are going to do the same thing for this next one. We are going to take the expression 9 minus z and we are going to evaluate it when z equals 7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the number 7 with parentheses around it and I am going to plug it in to this algebraic expression into the spot that I see a z. Anything that is not a z needs to be left alone and left exactly where it is. So leave this 9 alone, leave that minus sign alone, and then just in place of z you're going to plug in 7. Then I'm going to do the operation that I see here, 9 minus 7 is 2. So this expression is equal to 2 when z is equal to 7. So then for this last one, the parentheses are going to be extremely important here. We have the expression 1 half r, and we're going to evaluate it when r is equal to 18. Remember, there is hidden multiplication between this 1 half and this r. So what I am going to do is I'm going to take the number 18, and I am going to plug it into the expression into every single spot I see an r, and please use parentheses. And anything that is not an r needs to be left alone and left exactly where it is. So I have one half that I'm going to leave alone, and then I'm going to plug 18 in for r. And then remember, this is implied multiplication, so one half times 18 is 9. So with multiple variables, you do just need to plug in the appropriate value into the appropriate variable. So a over b is what is called a multivariable expression. And we're going to evaluate the expression a over b when a is equal to 63 and b is equal to 9. So I'm going to take this expression and then in place of a, I'm going to plug in 63. And then in place of b, I am going to plug in 9. And remember, they need to remain exactly where they are in the variable expression, and that divided by between them does need to stay there. So I'm going to plug in 63 for a, leave the divided by sign where it is, and then I'm going to plug in 9 for b. Then I'm going to do the operation that yeah, I see here, remember, fractions are also division. So you can look at this as 63 over 9, or you could look at this as 63 divided by 9, which is, in either case, equal to 7. Now, another... An application of evaluating algebraic expressions, especially multivariable expressions, is in what are called formulas. So a formula is an equation that indicates how two or more variables are related to each other. And formulas are evaluated in the exact same way as evaluating an algebraic expression that has more than one variable. You just have to keep in mind that a formula will be applied to a specific context, such as the area of a rectangle. So each of these variables will stand for something specific to that formula. So for example, let's say that the speed of an object s is given by the formula s equals d divided by t, where s is the speed, d is the distance traveled by the object, and t is the time spent traveling. So we're going to find the speed of the car that has traveled at 150 miles in three hours. So in a formula, each variable stands for something specific. In this case, S stands for speed, D stands for distance, and T stands for time. So when you're told to evaluate a formula at given values, you do have to kind of figure out what variable you are plugging each of those numbers in for. So we are finding the speed, which means we are finding S, so we're just going to leave S alone in this formula that has traveled 150 miles. Now 150 miles is a distance. 
which variable stood for distance. That was D. So we're going to be plugging 150 in for D. In three hours, well, three hours is a time. T stood for time, so I'm going to be plugging three in for T. So I'm going to leave S alone since that's what I'm trying to find. Then in place of D, I am going to plug in 150. And then in place of T, I am going to plug in 3. And then everything else in that formula, I am going to leave alone. So I'm going to plug in 150 in for D, leave the divided by sign alone, and then plug in 3 for T. Remember, you can think of this as 150 over 3, or you can think of this as 150 divided by 3, because fractions are the same as division, as we're going to get to later. So 150 divided by 3 is 50. So speed would be measured in miles per hour. So the speed of a car that travels at 150 miles in three hours is, is 50 miles per hour. So I want you guys to give this next one a try. The area, the area A of a rectangle of length L and width W is given by the formula A equals LW. Remember, if you don't see anything between these two variables, there is hidden multiplication between these two variables. So the area A equals the length L times the width W. So I want you guys to find the area when L equals 24.5 inches and W equals 16 inches. Okay, so remember, in a formula, you do have to remember, you have to figure out what are you plugging in for what variable. So we are finding the area, which means that we are going to be finding A, which means in this formula, I'm just going to leave A alone. When L is 24.5 inches, so in place of L, I am going to be plugging in 24.5 with parentheses around it. And then in place of W, I am going to be plugging in 16 with parentheses around it. So then A is going to be equal to L, which is 24.5, times W, which is 16. And then when you multiply these two, you get an area of 392. Now, if the length and the width are both in inches, area is going to be in inches squared, so square inches. So the area of this rectangle is 392 square inches. So this is another one that I want you guys to try. So commuting to work via bicycle has, you know, increased in popularity. And you can rent bicycles in a lot of big cities. You've probably seen these before. So let's say that bikes are picked up and returned at specific docking stations. And the payment is approximately $1.50 per 30 minutes. And let's say that this person, Richard, bicycles 18 miles to work. The time T in hours that it takes to bike the 18 miles is given by the formula T equals 18 divided by R, where R is the speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the time that it takes Richard to commute to work if his speed is 15 miles per hour. Now, you do have to be careful in a lot of word problems. You might be given what is called extraneous information, which is information that, you know, while might be important for how much it costs to rent this bike, it may not exactly be important to the specific problem. So I want you guys to kind of read through this problem, figure out what you need to know to evaluate this formula and answer the question, and then I want you guys to figure out what you are plugging in for what variable. So go ahead and pause the video and resume when you are done. Okay, so when you're figuring out what am I supposed to do, look for the question words, like find. Find the time that it takes to commute to work. So that is going to be asking us to find the time t. If his speed is 15 miles per hour, so which variable stood for speed? It did tell us that r stood for speed. So it's telling us that r is equal to 15. And it did give us a formula for finding time. The time t that it takes to bike those 15 
those 18 miles is given by the formula T equals 18 divided by R. So this is the formula that we're going to use. We are going to find T and we're going to evaluate this formula when R is equal to 15. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula and I'm going to plug 15 in for R. Now remember, in this formula, anything that is not in R needs to be left alone and left exactly where it is, which does include that 18 in the numerator. So when we plug this in, we have, we're going to leave T alone because that's what we're trying to find. We're going to leave the 18 alone. And then in place of R, we're going to plug in 15. So yes, 18 divided by 15 is a decimal. Decimals are a reality. That means it takes 1.2 hours to commute for this person to commute the 18 miles to work on bicycle. So yes, you can have a decimal or a fraction for an answer. That is completely that, and especially in real life context, that happens all the time. So it takes 1.2 hours for this person to bicycle to work. Now, word problems are going to be a reality in this class. We're going to be doing a lot of them, and we're going to be doing a variety of different types of word problems, and a lot of the things that we're going to be doing are going to be applied to some sort of real-life context. Now, when we are applying any of the mathematics to any sort of real life context, we do need to keep in mind that math is like a language, like any other language. And you can translate expressions that are in English into expressions that are in math by simply remembering some of the key important uh, phrases that will translate from English into math directly. For example, of. Now, of is one of those words that fulfills a variety of grammatical contexts in the English language. But if you just see of by itself, like what is 4% of 8, when of is just by itself like that, it means multiply. Now the word and, when it is not fulfilling some sort of grammatical need, also is going to mean add. So for example, if you have 18 and 5, that is saying find 18 plus 5. Plus also is another word for adding. Difference is subtract, and it does matter what order those numbers are listed in, since order does matter with subtraction. Less also means subtract. We're not going to be doing. We're going to be doing a little bit with exponents in here, but we're going. To, you're going to be doing more with exponents in your next class. So if you square a number or squaring a number means raising it to the power two. Now, in a lot of word problems, you're going to need to find where the equal sign is because formulas or equations do involve an equal sign. So there are a lot of different words for the equal sign. Is is a very common one. So, for example, half of eight is four. Unless is is fulfilling some sort of grammatical context, and if is is by itself, like half of eight is four, the is in that instance means equals. Is the same as also means equals, yields, results in, all mean the equal sign. Now all of these, this is not a complete list, but all of these are synonyms for addition. So added to, more, sum of, increase by, plus, total of, things like that. All of these means subtracting. Again, depending on the context, less than can be, you know, interpreted as an inequality sign. But minus, that means subtract. Difference, subtracted from, decreased by, all of those mean subtracting. All of these mean multiply of when it's by itself. So if of is serving some sort of grammatical purpose, it won't mean multiply. But if of is by itself, like 4% of 8, that means multiply. Times is another synonym for multiply. So is product of multiplied by twice. Twice a number is doubling it, which means you're multiplying it by 2. Tripling a number means you're multiplying it by 3. Quadrupling a number means you're multiplying it by 4. So all of those are specific multipliers of specific numbers, like 2, 3, or 4. All of these mean divide. Divided by, quotient of, ratio of. 
and then splitting or dividing into X number of equal parts. So that's what division is. Division is splitting something, splitting a quantity into equal parts. So if you're dividing or splitting a quantity into equal parts, you are doing division. Now, both of these mean raising to a specific power. So squaring means raising something to the power 2. A cube is another very common term for an exponent of 3. So if you are cubing a number, you are raising it to an exponent of 3. We're going to get more into exponents and a little bit later in this chapter. So what we're going to do with each of these is we are going to translate each of these expressions into math. So remember, a variable is going to stand for an unknown number. And unless you are told what specific letter to use for that unknown number, it is ultimately up to you what variable, what letter you choose to represent that variable. So twice some number, let's call some number y, for example. So some number, that's an unknown number. I'm going to call it a variable y. Now twice means multiplying by 2. So twice some number means we're taking the number 2 and we're multiplying it by our variable y. You don't necessarily need the multiplication in between them. You can just write 2y and that means the same thing. So the multiplication dot between the 2 and the y isn't necessary, but it's not wrong. So for this next one, 7 less than some number. So some number, again, we've got another variable. Let's call that variable x. Now, less means subtracting. And the order that these things appear is important in subtraction because order does matter with subtraction. So 7 less than some number, 7 less than x, means we have to remember 7 less than x. So that means we're taking this variable x and we are taking 7 less than that. So 7 is being taken away from x, which means this is the expression x minus 7, because 7 is being taken away from the variable x. So for the next one, 18 more than a number. So a number, some unknown number, let's come up with a variable for it. Let's call it t. Doesn't really matter. I'm just using whatever variables I want. 18 more than some number t. So more than, you might have remembered that from the addition list. That means addition. So 18 more than some number t is 18 plus t. Now remember, order doesn't matter with addition, so you can write this as t plus 18 if you want to, and it means the same thing. So order doesn't matter with addition, but it does matter with subtraction. 7 less than some number would be some number x minus 7. So then for this next one, we have a number, which is another unknown number. Let's give it a variable, divided by 5. So divided by means division. 5. So we have some number m divided by 5, and you can do this in one of two ways. You can use the actual division symbol, and that's completely okay. Or you can write this as a fraction. m over 5 can also be read as m divided by 5. Fractions are the same as division, because fractions happen when you divide two numbers. So m over 5 is a completely acceptable way to write m divided by 5. So for this next one, we're going to translate each of these phrases into math. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to pause the video and try your hand at this. I want you guys to translate each of these phrases into math. All right, so let's do the first one. So we have five more than some number. So some number, let's give it a variable, let's call it n. More than, you might remember that was on the synonym list for addition. So you can either write this as five plus n, or if you want to, n plus five. Doesn't really matter because order does not matter with addition. Now for the next one, half of a number. So a number, let's call it t. 
half is one half. And then we have this word of. So this is an example of the word of that is just kind of by itself. So remember, when of is just by itself, it means multiplying. So half of a number is one half times some number t, which you can leave the multiplication dot there if you want to, or you can write it as just one half times t. Now this next one's a little more complicated. We have five more than three times some number. So let's give you know, some number a variable, let's call it p. Five more than three times that number. So three times that number p is going to be three times p. And then we, are five, we have five more than that. So more than is addition. So this is going to be the expression 3p plus 5. Or if you want to write it as 5 plus 3p, that doesn't really matter because order doesn't matter with addition. So 5 more than added to 3 times some number, which is 3 times that variable. Now for the next one, the difference of two numbers. Difference of, this is an example where of is fulfilling a grammatical need because difference two numbers doesn't make sense. So difference of two numbers. Of does not mean multiplication here. It really does go with difference. Difference means subtraction. And we have two unknown numbers. Let's call them x and y. So the difference of x and y would be difference between x and y, x minus y. So then we have this next one, six less than the product of two numbers. So product of means multiplication. Two numbers, let's call them x and y again, why not? So we have six less than the product of two numbers. So we have the product of two numbers, and then we have six less than that, which means we're taking this product and we are taking away six. So this would translate to x times y minus six. So then for the next one, 76% of some number. So that some number, let's call it Z, because why not? 76% of. So of, trans when it's by itself like this, translates to multiplication. So 76% of some number Z is 76% times some number Z. We're going to be talking a lot more about percents a little bit later and how to use percents and how you would actually go about computing something like this. But for now, we're just working on translating these expressions into math. And then for the last one, we have four less than twice some number. So some number, let's call it x. Twice, you might remember, is multiplying by two. So twice some number would be two times x or two x. And you might remember less than was on the synonym list for subtraction. So we have four less than twice some number. So we're taking some 2x and we are taking four less than that. So we're taking 2x and we are taking four away from it. So this will translate into the expression 2x minus four. So being able to translate expressions that are in English into some expression involving math is going to be extremely important when you are solving any sort of word problem, especially when the formula is not expressly given. And especially when in that word problem, you need to figure out what, which, uh, which number stands for which variable. So this is an application of doing exactly that, of using your skills at translating English into math to translate a formula from English into math, and then using evaluating variable expressions to evaluate that formula at some given values. So we have the markup M on an item is its selling price S minus its cost C. So let's first translate that into a formula. So we have the markup M is, when is it's by itself, remember, that means equals. So the is in this case, because it's kind of by itself, surrounded by a bunch of numbers, is the equal sign. It's selling price S minus, minus means subtraction, it's cost C. So let's translate that kind of word by word into a mathematical formula. So the markup M is 
equals its selling price S minus its cost C. So that is the markup formula expressed in math. So then for part B, let's say that a digital camera cost a retailer $399.95 and was then sold for $559. And we're going to figure out how much was the markup on the camera. So if you don't know what a markup is, a markup is when a store owner charges its, their customers more for an item than they paid for it because they usually have to buy the items from some sort of wholesaler at a specific cost. Then in order to make a profit, they need to sell it at more than what it costs them. So they, they add on a specific markup to that price and sell it at a higher price. And that difference is going to be their profit. That difference is also going to be the markup. So a digital camera costs a retailer $399.95. So which variable does that $399.95 represent? Well, that is the variable C because that is what it costs the retailer and C stands for cost. Then it was sold for $559. That is going to be S because S is the selling price. Now, when you're trying to figure out what am I supposed to do here, you need to look for the question words. How much was the markup? So what we are asked to find is the markup, which is the variable M. So we are finding M when its cost C is $399.95 and its selling price S is $559. So I'm going to take my formula. Since I am finding M, I'm going to leave M alone. And then in for S, I am going to plug in the selling price, $559. I accidentally circled that because my stylus is hard to maneuver, so the, leave the minus sign alone. And then for C, I'm going to be plugging in $399.95. So let's plug each of these into their appropriate variables. And remember that minus sign that's between them needs to be left alone and left exactly where it is. So S is 559 minus the cost C, 399.95. So then when you do 559 minus 399.95, you get a markup of 100 and, sorry, $159 and five cents. And don't forget, this does need a unit. It is applied to something. So the markup in dollars is $159 and five cents. So in any algebraic expression, you have what are you have all different kinds of numbers. So we've seen everything in you know up till now from fractions to decimals to whole numbers and there are different categories of numbers that are all kind of treated differently and they're all kind of considered different kinds of numbers. Fractions and decimals are considered different than whole numbers. So numbers are classified by category and the category that we classify numbers in is based on the structure of that number. And many of the different kinds of numbers, their categories do overlap. For example, you know that you can convert a fraction into a decimal. So fractions and decimals do overlap each other. Now, we have what are called the real numbers. The real numbers are the broad category of all different types of real numbers that we will work with in this class. So 159.05 is a real number. 559 is a real number. That 18 over 15 is a real number. So real numbers are just the broad category to stand for all the numbers that we're going to be working with in this class. Yes, there are non-real numbers. That, you're, that is not this class. That is college algebra. Now, real numbers are any numbers that can be represented as points on what are called the real number line. So real numbers include all of the positive and negative whole numbers, all of the positive, negative fractions and decimals, and zero. Zero is one of those numbers that's neither positive nor negative. So zero is just zero, and it is a real number. Now, real numbers have several subgroups. The subgroups of real numbers are called the natural numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, and the irrational numbers. Now, the real number line that was referenced on the last slide looks something like this. The real number line is a horizontal line with arrows on both ends 
with zero in the middle. The reason that there are arrows on both ends of the number line is because the number line does continue forever and ever. So anytime that you draw a number line, you're only technically drawing a piece of it. So this number line can go past four and it can go past negative four. So yeah, negative five, negative 10, those are all on the real number line as are 100 and 200. That's why the arrows are there. Now, this number line here is labeled with positive and negative whole numbers, which are called integers. And we're going to get to that definition in a minute. So most of the time, real number lines have zero in the middle, and they are labeled with positive and negative whole numbers. So it is labeled with the positive whole numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the negative whole numbers negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and negative 4. However, even though the number line is usually labeled with whole numbers, you can place any real number on the real number line. So any fraction or decimal can be represented as points on the real number line. So for example, the number negative 2.4 can be represented as a point that is between negative 2 and negative 3. The fraction 3 quarters can be represented as a point between 0 and 1, closer to 1 than it is to 0. And the decimal 3.8 can be represented as this point on the number line between 3 and 4, but pretty close to 4. So real numbers are any numbers that can be represented as points on the real number line. Now for the subgroups of real numbers, we have what are called the natural numbers and the integers. The natural numbers are the counting numbers, and I like to use the analogy that the natural numbers are the numbers that you first learn to count when you were counting on your fingers. When you were a little kid and you were learning one, two, three, four. So the natural numbers are the counting numbers. They're all the whole numbers that are greater than zero. So they start with one, and yes, there are infinitely many of them, so I just listed a whole bunch of them. The dot, dot, dot here on the end means they do continue on forever, so there is an infinite number of them. Now this method of writing these numbers with the braces on either end is what is called writing them in set notation or writing them in what's called the roster method. Now natural numbers are the positive whole numbers that are bigger than zero. Integers are all of the positive and negative whole numbers and zero. Zero is neither positive nor negative which is why it's its own category but the integers are all of the positive whole numbers all the negative whole numbers, and zero. So these are an example of the integers. We have negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And again, the, air, the dot, dot, dots on either end means that this is only a sampling of them. There are infinitely many integers. So there's an infinite number of integers, and they do go past positive five, and they do go past negative five. Now, on the real number line, speaking of integers, on the real number line, zero is in the middle of the real number line for a reason, because zero is neither positive nor negative. Now, positive numbers are any numbers that are greater than zero. And on the real number line, positive numbers are placed to the right of zero. So to the right of zero here are all of the positive numbers. Negative numbers are numbers that are less than zero, and on the number line, negative numbers are placed to the left of zero. So a signed number is a number that, with a sign to its immediate left that indicates if it's positive or negative. Now a lot of times, and especially algebraic expressions, positive numbers might have a plus sign next to them, especially to separate them from other terms. But if you don't see a sign to the immediate left of a number, that does mean it's positive. Now, negative numbers will always have that minus sign to its immediate left. So remember, a number always takes the sign to its immediate left. So a signed number is a number with a sign indicating if it's positive or negative. So just keep in mind that if you don't see any sign next to the immediate left of a number, it is positive. So the integers are the positive and negative whole numbers and zero, and they continue infinitely on in both directions, as indicated by both the arrows and the dot, dot, dots. So a couple notes on signed numbers. I'm going to emphasize this till you're sick of hearing it. 
A number always takes the sign to its immediate left. If there is no sign to its immediate left, then the number is positive. If there is a plus sign to the number's immediate left, that means it is positive. If there is a minus sign to its immediate left, then the number is negative. So any time that you're doing anything, I don't care if it's an al if you're solving an algebraic equation or if you're graphing or if you're just in this first section here, always pay attention to the sign that is immediately to the left of any number or variable. So on a number line, we also have what are called opposites. So two numbers that are the same distance from zero, but on opposite sides of zero are called opposites. So opposites are also called additive inverses because when you add them together, they add up to zero. So any time that you add opposites or additive inverses together, they're always going to add up to zero. We're going to get more into adding and subtracting sign numbers in the next video, but just to give you this bit of information now, opposites always add up to zero. So for example, on this number line here, one and negative one are opposites because they are each one unit away from zero. One is to the right of zero, negative one is to the left of zero. So these two are considered opposites. 2 and negative 2 are also considered opposites because 2 is 2 units to the right of 0, negative 2 is 2 units to the left of 0. So they're the same distance away from 0 on the number line, and, but they're on opposite sides of 0. 2 is on the right, negative 2 is on the left. Same thing with negative 3 and 3. These are also examples of opposites. 3 is 3 units to the right of 0, negative 3 is 3 units to the left of 0. And then another pair of opposites is 4 and negative 4. And these are just the ones that are shown. 5 and negative 5, 10 and negative 10, 100 and negative 100. So those are all examples of opposites. They're not just limited to these. Now, when you're comparing signed numbers, comparing signed numbers meaning determining which one is bigger and which one is smaller, one way that you can compare signed numbers is to locate the points on a number line. Either you can draw a number line and physically plot the points on the number line, or you could do this mentally. A number to the right is always larger than a number to the left. So as you go to the right on the number line, the numbers are getting bigger. Vice versa, as you go to the left on the number line, the numbers are getting smaller. Now, negative numbers are always smaller than positive numbers. Now, the more negative a number is, the smaller it is. So, you know, negative 10 is technically smaller than negative 2. Now, 0 is always greater than any negative number because negative numbers are always to the left of 0. On the flip side, 0 is also always less than any positive number since positive numbers are always to the right of 0. Now you can compare signed numbers by using what are called the inequality symbols. So inequality symbols, these are the four that we're going to focus on. This means the symbol less than. This is the greater than symbol. This next symbol means less than or equal to, and yes, it is an or. You, you can't be less than and equal to at the same time, so this just means less than or equal to. The little line underneath means the or equal to part. And then this symbol here means greater than or equal to, and the little line underneath means the or equal to. Especially with negative numbers, it can be really tricky to determine in, you know, which one is bigger and which one is smaller because the, quote, more negative a number is, the smaller it technically is. And if you were to plot these on the number line, negative 8 is to the left of negative 3. So negative 8 is technically less than negative 3 because negative 8 degrees Fahrenheit is colder than negative 3 degrees. So negative 8 is less than negative 3, so I'm going to indicate that with the inequality symbol less than. One easy way to tell the difference between the less than symbol and the greater than symbol is the less than symbol kind of looks like a smushed L and you can make the less than symbol with your left hand. 
However you want to remember them, you do need to know the difference between the less than symbol and the greater than symbol. Or if you want to think of it as the alligator is eating the bigger number, if you learned that when you were in elementary school, you can do that as well. So what we're going to do here is we're going to replace the appropriate inequality symbol between the two integers. If it helps, plot them on a number line. A number to the right is always bigger than a number to the left. If it helps to think in terms of temperature, which one is colder, which one is warmer, you can do that too. But what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to pause the video, place the appropriate inequality symbol between these two integers, and then resume the video when you are ready to check your answer. All right, so we have the integers negative 2 and positive 1. So the integer negative 2 is right here. The integer positive 1 is right here. 1 is to the right of negative 2. Also, a positive number is always greater than a negative number. So negative 2 is actually less than 1. Alligators eating the bigger number, so negative 2 is less than 1. You can also think of this as negative 2 degrees is colder than 1 degree. And then we have the numbers 3 and 0. So remember, 3 is a positive number. Positive numbers are always greater than 0 because positive numbers are to the right of 0 on the number line. So 3 is greater than 0. Now, another topic that we're going to talk about while we're talking about signed numbers is something called absolute value. The absolute value of a number is its distance away from zero on the number line. So how many units away from zero is this number? Now, absolute value is an operation, and you're going to learn a lot more about absolute value in later courses. So the absolute value is technically an operation. So the absolute value of a number is represented by these two vertical bars that will be placed on either side of a number. And what it is asking is, how many units is this number away from zero? So for example, the absolute value of negative 2. The absolute value of negative 2, which is how you would read this, is asking on a number line, how many units away from zero is the number negative two? Well, negative two is two units away from zero. So the absolute value of negative two is equal to two because it is two units away from zero. Now for this next one, if you're looking at the absolute value of three, this is asking how many units away from zero is the number three on the number line. So three is three units away from zero. So th the absolute value of three is equal to three. Now distance is always positive. So absolute value is looking for the distance away from zero and it doesn't absolute value does not care whether the number is to the right or to the left of zero it just asks how far away from zero is this number so that means absolute value is always positive because distances are always positive so a few absolute value properties. The absolute value of a positive number is the number itself because it's just asking how far away from zero is this? Don't care about direction. The absolute value of a negative number is its opposite because again, it's asking for how far is it away from zero? What's the distance away from zero? And it doesn't care about direction. Now the absolute value of zero is zero itself because zero is zero units away from zero. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to find each of these absolute values. So feel free to pause the video and resume when you're ready to check your answer. All right, so the absolute value of 8. How far away from 0 is the number 8? So 8 is 8 units away from 0, so the absolute value of 8 is 8. The absolute value of zero is zero because zero is zero units away from zero. For the absolute value of negative two, it is asking how many units away from zero is negative two? Well, that is two units away from zero. So the absolute value of negative two is two. Now for the absolute value of five, how far away from zero is five on the number line? It is five units away. So the absolute value of five is five.
Now, there are other types of real numbers besides the natural numbers and the integers. So we have also what are called rational numbers. Rational numbers are the technical term for a fraction. So they are the quotient of two integers. So rational numbers happen when you take two integers and you divide them. So quotient of two integers means it is a fraction with a whole number on the top and a whole number on the bottom. And notice that it says integers. So fractions can and will be negative because if one of those integers is a negative, that means your fraction is a negative. So rational numbers contain a whole number in the numerator, which is the top number in a fraction, and a whole number in the denominator. So rational numbers are numbers that are any number that can be written in the form of a over b, where a and b are both whole numbers, and b, the number on the bottom, is not equal to zero. So we're going to cover this a little bit more later. You cannot divide by zero, so you cannot have a zero in the denominator of a fraction. But the numerator of a fraction can be zero. And if the numerator of a fraction is zero, that means the entire fraction is equal to zero because fractions are the same as dividing. So zero divided by anything is zero. If you split zero into five equal parts by doing zero divided by five, it is still going to come out to zero. So you cannot divide by zero because you can't split something into zero equal parts. So you cannot have a zero in the denominator, but you can have a zero in the numerator. Now, rational numbers are any numbers that can be written as a simple fraction with a whole number in the numerator and a whole number in the denominator. So rational numbers can be improper fractions, which is when the numerator is bigger than the denominator. So three halves here is technically a rational number because it can be written in the form of the whole number three divided by the whole number two. And fractions can be negative. So for example, we can have the fraction negative three over four. We have the whole number negative three in the numerator and the whole number four in the denominator. Now, Technically, since you can write any whole number as a fraction by putting it over 1, all whole numbers are also considered rational numbers because a rational number is any number that can be represented as a simple fraction. So you could take the whole number 10 and turn it into a fraction by putting it over 1. So this is an example where some of the subgroups of real numbers do overlap. All whole numbers are also considered rational numbers because you can take any whole number and turn it into a fraction by putting it over one. So since you can express a whole number as a simple fraction, whole numbers, both positive and negative, can be are considered rational numbers. Zero as well, since zero can be written as you know any sort of fraction because zero divided by anything is zero. Zero is technically also considered a rational number as well as an integer. Now, terminating and repeating decimals are another one. So, for example, you have the decimal 0 0.5. What's 0 0.5 as a fraction? Well, 0 0.5 as a fraction is 1 half. So, technically, decimals like 0 0.5 are also considered rational numbers because they can be written as simple fractions. Same thing with 0 0.3 repeating. So, 0 0.3 repeating is the fraction one-third as a decimal. So since you can write 0.3 repeating as the simple fraction one-third, any number that can be represented as a simple fraction is considered a rational number. So 0.3 repeating would be considered a rational number. Now mixed numbers. Mixed numbers can be written as improper fractions. So you can take the mixed number one and a half and write it as the improper fraction three halves. So because you can turn any mixed number into an improper fraction, mixed numbers are also considered rational numbers because you can convert any mixed number into a simple fraction with one whole number in the numerator and one whole number in the denominator. So speaking a little bit more on decimals, decimals can, you know, they can fit into a variety of different types of subgroups. So 
Just a little bit on decimals first before we get into that. Each decimal has a whole number part, which is the number that comes before the decimal point. And each decimal has a fractional part, which is the number that comes after the decimal point. Now, technically, any whole number is considered a decimal, technically, because a, whole, a number without a decimal point is always assumed to have a decimal point at the right end of the number. So, for example, the whole number 3 doesn't have a decimal point, but you can easily put a decimal point to the immediate right end of the number. And you can put as many zeros as you want or need after that decimal point and not change the number. So the number 3.0 is the same as the whole number 3. 3.00 is the same as 3. 3.000 is the same as 3. So you can put as many zeros af after that decimal point as you want or need without actually changing the value of that number. So the fractional part of any decimal has a power of 10 as its denominator. So the number 3.4 is technically read as 3 and 4 tenths. Translating 3 and 4 tenths into math would be read as 3 and plus 4 tenths. So each number that comes after the decimal point will have a power of 10. Now different types of decimals that we've already sort of talked about a couple slides ago. If the decimal stops, it is called a terminating decimal. So a terminating decimal is a decimal that stops like 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 is a terminating decimal. A decimal that has a distinct pattern that repeats forever and ever and ever is called a repeating decimal. So for example, 0.3 repeating, which can also be written as 0.3 bar, is an example of a repeating decimal. Now terminating and repeating decimals are also rational numbers because they can be written as simple fractions. So for example, 0.5 can be represented as the fraction 1 half, so 0.5 is technically a rational number. Same thing with the rational number 0 0.75. 0 0.75 is a terminating decimal and it can be written as the simple fraction 3 fourths. So because 0 0.75 can be written as a simple fraction 3 fourths, 0 0.75 is also considered a rational number. Now 0 0.3 repeating, since it can be written as the uh, simple fraction one third is also considered a rational number because 0.3 repeating can be written as that simple fraction one third. Another example is 0.1 repeating. So 0.1 repeating can be written as the simple fraction one ninth. So since you can write 0.1 repeating as the simple fraction one ninth, 0.1 repeating is considered a rational number. Now I do want to put the disclaimer. Not all decimals are rational numbers. Only decimals that can be written as simple fractions are considered rational numbers. Not every decimal can be written as a fraction. Those are a totally separate category. We're going to get to that in a bit, but just keep in mind, not all decimals are rational numbers. Just the ones that terminate or repeat. Now, Decimal places, each digit in a decimal has a place value. And you guys have learned place value before, mostly in the context of whole numbers. So I do have a place value chart with some whole numbers as well as some decimal places. So just to recap place value for whole numbers, those are the numbers that come before the decimal point. So all of these are whole numbers. So yeah, all of these would be the uh, whole number part that precedes the decimal point. The first digit is called the ones place. Then we have the tens place, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, etc. Now each number that comes after the decimal point are called decimal places and they have their own names and place values. So after the decimal point, the first number after the decimal point is called the tenths place. The second number after the decimal point is called the hundredths place. Third number after the decimal point is called the thousandths place. Then after that, fourth number after the decimal point is the ten thousandths place. Fifth number after the decimal point is called the hundred thousandths place. 
then we have the millionths place, and then it does technically keep going. So I know that in previous classes that are a prerequisite to this class, you have learned how to round numbers and how to round decimals. So if you are told to round to the hundredths place, that means you are told to round to the second decimal place. So we're just going to recap a little bit of place value. I know that you've learned place value with decimals before, and I know that you've learned how to round decimals before. So what I want you guys to do for each of these is each of these decimals has the number 3 in it. And I want you to identify the place value of the number 3. So go ahead and pause the video and identify the place value of the number 3. All right, so for this first one, this three is in the second decimal place. So it goes tenths, hundredths. So this three in this first decimal is in the hundredths place. For this next one, the three is the first number after the decimal point. So this is called the tenths place. And then over here, for this third decimal, the 3 is quite a ways away. So let's go through each of the place values. It goes tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths, hundred thousandths, millionths. So here we go. We have tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, and then hundred thousandths. So this is the hundred thousandths. Place. Now, decimals can be, you know, some decimals can be converted into fractions, and all fractions can be converted into decimals. That is why there are a lot of decimals that belong to the rational numbers category, because you can turn any fraction into a decimal. So the way to turn a fraction into a decimal is to take the numerator, the number on the top, and divide it by the number on the bottom. So I am going to allow you to use a calculator for things like this, which is why, you know, this is part of the reason why calculators required for this class. There's a ton of other reasons why. So you do need a scientific calculator for this class. So to convert 3 20ths into a decimal, you're just going to, on a calculator, take the top number 3 and divide it by the bottom number 20. So when you do that, you get 0.15. So 3 20ths is 0.15 as a decimal. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to pause the video and convert these next two into decimals. All right, so to convert 5 eighths into a decimal, you're going to take the top number 5 and divide it by the bottom number 8, which gives you 0.625. So keep in mind, 0 0.15, 0 0.625, these are each terminating decimals. They're both considered rational numbers because they can be turned into simple fractions. Now, 4 ninths, when you, to convert this into a decimal, you take the top number 4 divided by the bottom number 9, and you get 0 0.44444, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, so you get 0 0.4 repeating, which if you want to, you know, write it in a condensed format, you can write it as 0.4 bar. So this... Uh, point 0.4 repeating is also considered a rational number because it is the number 4 ninths as a decimal. Now I did make the huge disclaimer that not all decimals are rational numbers, just the ones that can be, can, can be converted into simple fractions. So not all decimals can be converted into simple fractions. So anytime that you have a decimal that cannot be converted into a fraction, you have an irrational number. So an irrational number is a number that cannot be written as a simple fraction. Irrational numbers cannot be written as a quotient of two integers. So these are decimals that you know, don't terminate, they don't repeat, they don't really have any discernible pattern. Uh, probably the most famous example of an irrational number is the number pi. Pi never stops, pi never repeats. So pi is 3.14159, blah, 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 and it goes on forever. So because pi has no repeating patterns, it, has, it never stops, pi is an irrational number, and the most famous one. However, pi is not the only irrational number. Square root of 2 
you know, if you do square root of two on a calculator, you get this giant gross decimal that doesn't terminate or repeat. So square root of two is an irrational number. You can't write this big gross decimal as a simple fraction. Now, irrational numbers can also be negative. So negative square root of three, which is, you know, this is a piece of it is also considered an irrational number. So any decimal that does not terminate or repeat and any decimal that cannot be turned into a fraction is an irrational number. Now, all of those different categories of numbers are lumped under the category of real numbers. So this is just a chart because I know there's there's a lot of overlap between these subgroups of numbers. So this chart just kind of keeps them all straight and kind of tells you what's a subgroup of what. So all of these subgroups are all under the general umbrella of the real numbers. Now in the real numbers, the two main subgroups are rational numbers and irrational numbers. So rational numbers are any number that can be written as a simple fraction. Irrational numbers are decimals that cannot be written as a simple fraction. Now irrational numbers don't have any subcategories because you know, there's, yes, there's an infinite number of them, but there's no real subcategories of irrational numbers. There are subcategories of rational numbers. So you have you know, your typical fractions, and then you have whole numbers, which are called integers. Because remember, since any integer can be written as a fraction by putting it over one, technically the integers are a subcategory of rational numbers. And in the integers, we have positive integers, we've got negative integers, and we have zero, which is neither positive nor negative. So hopefully this chart here will kind of help you keep straight of what are, sub, what are numbers or subcategories of what. And remember, all of these are all under the general umbrella of the real numbers. So that was just a little bit of an introduction to some basic algebra concepts and some basics on different types of numbers. So what we're going to be focusing on in this first part of the course is we are going to focus on the uh, operations around signed numbers. So we're going to be adding and subtracting signed numbers, multiplying and dividing signed numbers. And then once we've gotten that out of the way, we're going to get into our uh, first big topic of algebra, which is order of operations. So stay tuned for that. That in the next video, we're going to be covering adding and subtracting real numbers. So thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.